really, really helping me out. And yeah, I've been loving your show recently. I, I pretty new listener, but I have appreciated all the shows recently, and uh, I'm looking forward to getting into the archives. And uh, just appreciate that you've been exploring the fringes, flat Earth and holographic moon and CERN and all that stuff that uh, is helping me keep questioning my reality. So uh, thanks again. Keep up the great work, and uh, I'll keep listening. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. But we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. Happy days are here again, Higher Side Chatters. Drinking a little drink, smoking a little smoke from sunny San Diego. I'm Greg Carlwood, just trying to keep my head above water in this sea of madness we call modern day reality. And it ain't easy. But by now, every THC fan here should be familiar with Crow, his lunar wave footage, and the Hattie Bob research we've been talking about for a while. Is the moon a control system? Did spider beans bring an invading convoy of planets into our system in 18,000 B.C.? Are the brains of humanity played like harp strings based on their genotypes? These are the kind of questions one is left with when examining the Hattie Bob material. And as researchers deal with the translation of this now deceased Russian scientist's work, we continue to get a better understanding of his theories, his ideas, and the information he was trying to put out there. Not only is Crow at the forefront of this work, but recently a blogger by the name of James Alfred has also taken a major interest in the Hattie Bob trove and has written some great posts detailing his interpretations of the data and clarifying a lot of the confusing material, and I'll be damned if he isn't on the line with us, too. So let's get the ball, or whatever it is we're on, rolling. Of course, you'll all know guest one. Crow, say hello to the people for me. Howdy, thanks for having me (laughs) back, bud. Anytime. And then, of course, a big, warm, and not-too-weird welcome for the man behind the blog Sage Sigma Unbound. James, my man, welcome to THC. Hey, thanks for having me. I appreciate the, uh, the time interest in the work that I put together. Yeah, man. I mean, obviously, this is dense stuff, and it's been, uh, you're also working with the translation, so the way you've been able to break this down is, I think, as good as anybody I, I've seen. I mean, Crow and you are really giving more details of this work than I think anybody probably is or has, and you've got three posts now breaking down aspects of Hattie Bob's work. They're super detailed, and they do clarify the concept, so I have to give you props for that again. But I've also seen a lot of earlier conspiracy, occult, and UFO-related writings from you that are on that blog and also are really well done and interesting. And since I only know you from your blog, tell us a little bit about how you got interested in fringe research like this and what your early indications were that the world probably is weirder than we're made to believe. All right. Um, yeah, I guess to begin with... Uh Just as a kid, kind of grew up, my father was into things like the Bermuda Triangle, UFOs, Bigfoot, um, all that good stuff. I want to say I watched a lot of that in search of. That used to be on Mm. uh, one of the networks back in that time period. So throughout high school, middle school, the X-Files kind of got big. So I kind of kept going with researchers and books on Roswell, whatever the, the main theme was at the time. Continued to kind of dabble with it, then uh, went to the university here in town, kind of got away from it, and really just more or less rediscovered it a few years ago, kind of got back into it, um, listening to a couple podcasts that I found online, and then just kind of dug into it. I mean, there's just, it was amazing to see what I thought about the occult UFOs and the fringe 10 years ago, and where it's gone to now, just it's mind-boggling. So I kind of started this blog to basically allow me to kind of put the pieces together, present it, summarize it into kind of a fashion that makes sense to me so that I can make some sense of all of this stuff. Nice, nice. And you do a great job there. So with all the weirdness that is out there, obviously there's a ton, but what was it about the Hattie Bob material that compelled you to dedicate as much time to it as you have, as opposed to other things? I, I think it was one of the interviews you and Crow gave. I recall it was a, maybe a spring kind of day and I was walking around downtown with the uh, earbuds in. And, you, and then uh, Crow had mentioned the Hattie Bowe stuff, and I was just uh, blown away. I mean, this idea of this spider race and these uh, octaves more or less generating frequencies that dictate 
life on Earth, solar system. I mean, it was just, it caught me off guard, and I became fascinated with it. So then I think at one point in time, Crow put a link, I think on one of his posts on your website, that has a link to some translations. And then I just started to dig into it. I uh, kind of wanted to solve the puzzle. Again, you know, I don't mm-hmm. know if this is, you know, legitimate science research, but it's, it's absolutely fascinating. And uh, the amount of detail that are in those uh, translated works, it's, it's amazing. Right on. Now, I know you guys have had some conversations between the two of you. Crow, what are your thoughts on James' writing and the breakdown of some of this stuff? Well, I think it's safe to say at this point that James is probably the preeminent Hattie Bow guy um, that speaks English. Hopefully, when we do a show like this, maybe someone in Russia will hear this and uh, be able to lead us to more information. I mean, I think James summed it up well. You, you're always wondering... You know, are we looking at sci-fi here or not? You know, how, how I got pulled in, of course, was his parallels with the lunar wave. But what we see in James' work is kind of the analytical mind dealing with very tough translations and then systematizing it so that an English speaker can easily go through and make heads or tails of it. So, I mean, when I saw the Sage Sigma blog, I was, I was stunned because I know how much work that took. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, man, me too. I, I know we both shared the blog early on. We're like, hey, look at this guy. But although you are digging through a ton of material as far as, like you brought up, a, a Russian-speaking person maybe coming and adding to the puzzle, we're looking at a lot of information that you can look at through Google Translator. It's online and like these big data dumps, but it's not all of his material, right? I mean, as far as we know, there's actually a good percentage that isn't online. Uh, you're absolutely right. Uh, one of the links here that uh, Crow put on, I mean, there's multiple times where there'll be a reference to another component or another paragraph or another subset of his information. And uh, unfortunately, it's not online. I was I found a Russian website that I had forwarded to Crow last night, and I think there's mention that there's allegedly over 16,000 pages of material that was published by um, Hedibov. And, you know, where is that? What are the links? Uh, you know, I don't know. So we're really only seeing part of the the, the literature. Yeah. That makes it even more interesting. And um, so let's talk a bit, a bit about the actual breakdown. For those who need to be refreshed who are listening or maybe hearing about this for the first time, I'll read these eight points from your blog, James, and then we can get into more because this really does kind of sum up what Hattie Bob is saying throughout all these many, many pages. There existed a time in humanity's history where the current moon did not exist. In 18,337 B.C., a convoy of planets infected our solar system or created our solar system. The convoy of planets contained a race of alien beings from the Sir 4 star of the Big Dipper. Earth, having resources and being hospitable, was not able to defend itself from the alien race. The alien race is spider-like in nature. The spider race was called Atlanta and essentially placed their brains into human bodies. The sun and moon then are used to create cycles or frequencies of the super system, system, and subsystems that dedicate life on this planet. UFO knots are terrestrial nature and guardians of these systems of control. Different genotypes of humanity exist, and a specific genotype still carries with it the spider brain. I mean, even though we're talking about a lot of dense material, I think those eight points are pretty much the cliff notes, wouldn't you say, guys? Yeah, if I was, as I was listening to him, I almost felt like I was listening to an L. Ron Hubbard index book there. <laughs> um, I mean, it kind of gets like that. But yeah, I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about in James' work. That's no nonsense. I mean, to translate that all out and break it down to that kind of specificity, uh, there it is. And it is not easy to do, I can tell you that, going through the translations and getting it into English. But when you look at, at all the things you just described, I think for a basis of what some of the early Hattie Bob docs have to offer us, I mean, that is a perfect kind of indices of that work. Nice. So, James, you mentioned in your first post that we're not sure if Hattie Bob was a serious scientist, a sci-fi writer, or if this is some type of disinfo campaign. All valid concerns, but I'm curious if your opinion on its credibility has changed at all as you've gotten deeper. Um, you know, that's really still up in the air for me. I mean, I think at the end of the day, there's definitely some truth to this, but being a, a reader of different, you know, sci-fi books over the years and whatnot, I, I wonder where reality is blending into like allegorical uh, characterizations of different things, you know, is Fair. 
uh, to these things, are they something else? And he's just using this, uh, let's say, the solar system, the Earth, these complexes of control. Are they metaphors for, for something else? Um, you know, I, I think it's going to take a little bit more time for me personally to uh, continue to kind of digest the material and get to a point where I, where I kind of think that things kind of add up to a specific outcome. Right on. Crow, what, do you, what would you say about credibility? I mean, you've dug into this a lot, too. Obviously, it's credible enough to keep digging at it. It's interesting enough to keep looking at it. But as it gets weirder, I mean, you got to ask, what is this guy up to? You know, I think James, I can't say it any better than he did, but I would point out there are certain aspects of the work, like when I had come to know three definite things that I was pretty sure were right about the lunar wave, and there they were echoed by Hattie Bob's work and taken further. Um, other very interesting things uh, that correlate outside of Hattie Bob's work for me, the things like tonality and octaves, and even the transfer of this kind of melding into the periodic table of elements. Um, I think these are all very exciting things, but uh, what James said is spot on, and I always wonder, um, was this material sanitized? Um, in my work, I constantly say that the world we live in has been misdescribed, and when we look at Hattie Bob's work, we don't get a lot of reference to that. And so you wonder, are there certain things that just don't get put on paper? Was it put on paper? Did it get scrubbed out? So, I mean, the, the short answer is uh, James summed it perfectly. Right. And when we can't get a good answer, we have to look at things around the research that kind of give indications. And I actually think it's worth pointing out, if I remember correctly, there was uh, some connection to, to Israel in this research. When he died, was it confiscated? I think Crow, ahead, um, I, wasn't able, I actually wasn't able to find a lot on that yet. Uh, again, I'm probably only a quarter of the way through most of this stuff. Um, but I think Crow was able to find a, a, a mention of that in some of the works. I, I did. And so what I found, and in the kind of litany, the library I sent you, James, I believe at some point you're going to find a third-party biography where there are presumably Russian people really trying to tout what Hattie Bob did. And they're saying things like he, you know, solved com computer clock speeds that we still haven't solved here. They're saying things like he would be Richard and Gates if he was American, sure. Nobel Prizes and all those things. But um, in, the, in the text I was just referring to, it is claimed, and not in an offhand way, in a very straightforward way, it is claimed that the research was forced from his hands over to Israel with an oil company involved. And the funny thing is, is while James probably hasn't gotten there yet, I believe he has information about uh, Hattie Bob's connection with oil companies. And actually, in some of the Hattie Bob research, it sounds like he is lamenting his involvement with certain things that he did. And I have a feeling that may tie into some of the oil company work. I don't know, James, can you add anything about the oil companies? Yeah, there is a specific mention that uh, I want to say in the mid-80s, he was uh, on a council. He was the chairman of some council that basically engineered the design of difficult, and difficult is in quotation marks, uh, wells and drilling technologies. And at some point in time, there appeared to be, again, this is from some biographies that I found online, a, a bit of a, a dispute between him and the oil company and that he wasn't being paid for the work that he was completing. So he more or less went on strike um, but continue to use the oil company's uh, computers and calculation machines and so forth and generated these, what he called basically is a, a special system. He basically at this point in time cracked some special system. And I don't know if that's a program that's basically the biological program that's over life or if that's something in regards to oil fields or whatnot. He did have an interesting thing, and I just thought of this, uh, one of the control complexes is Mount Kailash in Tibet and China. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Kailash. Uh, Kailash, thank you. And uh, mm -hmm. at one point in time, he says, um, if you attempt to drill in this area, you get slapped. So I don't know if he at one point in time was engaged in engineering some sort of drilling equipment mm -hmm. around that part of the world, but he basically just says, you can't drill there, you're going to get slapped. And I thought that was kind of an interesting correlation to oil drilling and so forth. That's totally interesting, and that actually uh, has a parallel with Richard Shaver. I mean, a lot of people think his material about the hollow earth is sure. way far out there, but he says he got it because he was drilling deep down, and he eventually started hearing conversations with beings that weren't human. That's interesting. 
So, I mean, there's that parallel. Also, it kind of parallels Tesla's story, too. I mean, when he was working with electric companies doing research and, uh, you know, stumbling upon new information, and he probably regretted his involvement with big electric companies. And then when he died, alphabet agencies came and stole the material, as far as we know. So we're dealing with a guy who we know at least that he was employed at a high level in a highly skilled area and a scientific area. And that's important information. Then we know that his data was taken when he died by someone that seems like they're, I mean, a group, an Israeli group, a university. I mean, those are the kind of people that seem fairly high up the pyramid that are trying to corral any fringe data that might be out there. So those little anecdotal stories, I think they do build a case that this guy was probably had some parallels to both Shaver and, and Tesla, maybe. You know, there, there is some references, and this is funny because I had five Russian speakers. Actually, there may have been a couple more, but five main Russian speakers who helped me translate, and I had kicked, you know, most of these documents over to James, everything I could find, but one of them had complained that they were worried that his material was disappearing because they had seen something they couldn't find again. Similar thing happened to me because there was some reference, which I just kind of alluded to, where it sounded like Hattiebob was saying that he regretted some of the work that he had been involved with, and it seemed like it was with weapon systems and other kind of military applications, but that led one of the translators to start grabbing all these Hattie Bob documents, PDFing them and trying to save them down because there was a real concern that now, you know, he was being mentioned on YouTube that things were disappearing, but it was more than a concern because what I just said to you, I could not find the reference document or web page again that gave me that information and this individual had also stated a similar concern where they were reading something and now they couldn't find it it didn't seem to be posted anymore mm. yeah it's very true and even some of the links that uh, crow had forwarded to me don't necessarily open up um, and these are embedded in documents that crow had received at some point in time in the, in the past so I, I don't know if it's just a, a server's down or what but uh, some of these links don't work any longer damn yeah, that, that wouldn't be the first time we've seen that either. Some information gets up, and then they plug the hole as as people start talking about it. But let's actually talk about the material. James, let me have you break down these three systems, because you've done a lot to clarify the details of what he's saying. And when we talk about the systems, I guess we're talking about everything that's in our solar system or this uh, this network of apparatuses that control life on the planet Earth. Walk us through some of the details and bullet points of this post. Maybe we should start with the super system, I guess. What are the details there? This is interesting. The super system, and I had found this just recently through some of the things. Uh, the super system, from what I gather, again, this is just me speculating based on the material. It was initially put on this planet, in this solar system, excluding things such as the sun and the moon, by a stewardship program from the Orion Cluster Group. I know this sounds out there, but uh, <laughs> in course with the rest of this material, it kind of fits the thing. So it's the idea that this steward program from the Orion Cluster Group of Civilizations more or less uh, imported humans to this planet. So there is an already an existing system of control on this planet. At some point of this process, um, there's supposed to be a transition from the Orion Cluster Group to the Sirius Cluster Group of Civilizations. And I think what the literature is saying is at that point in time of transition, there was more or less like a weakness um, in our existing super system. So you have to kind of picture here's the modern solar sy system again, minus some moons, our moon, the sun, um, and it's kind of weak. At that point, there is mention that this spider race, and I actually was able to find a new name for this. It was called the Cluster Ebrovskoy System. And I don't know if I'm butchering that or what, but um, it's E-B-R-O-V-S-K-O-Y in case anybody wants to try to Google that. And at this point in time, because of this weakening, they basically came in, took over our planet, brought with them the sun, which is again a planet, which is referenced in some of Crow's works and some of the things on YouTube, three moons, and um, nearly 4,000 attack objects. So at this point in time, you can kind of picture, and again, this is happening around starting at like 26,000 B.C., and the completion of this transition where this new cluster and this new management system basically comes in happens around 18,000 BC. So at that point in time, you've got this new race that's basically wiped out all life on Mars and on Earth. 
again, I know I'm jumping around here, but I'm trying to kind of put a larger uh, scope on this. Sure. Um, and at that point, wipes out Earth, more or less, uh, destroys the existing subsystems on this planet, some of the control structures and so forth, and rebuilds them under the mold of this uh, Ibrovsky management system. So they're be- And then at that point in time, they're starting to reboot life on Earth. There's these genomes getting introduced and so forth. So that's kind of the, the precursor to all of this. So, um, from what I can gather, the existing system now is the, the super system, and that would include the sun, uh, the moon, and a couple of other satellites, other moons in our solar system. They're primarily designed to control cycle time, and they more or less accommodate the transfer of uh, different programs for implementation on the planet Earth. Right on. And they also are more or less the guardians. Uh, when you get into the UFO literature of Hattie Bow, there's mention that this super system is basically... Uh, here to protect us. So say there's a friendly alien race or whatever wants to come in and, and save us, they can't. This, this solar system is, and this super system is designed to keep things out, things from intervening with humanity at this point in time. So the super system is kind of a multiple function thing, but at a very high level, it's basically controlling time, it's accommodating transfer of programs, and it's acting as a security system on planet Earth. Yeah, man, that, it's obviously super intense stuff. Me and Crow have talked about it a little bit on the air before, but the super system, I guess, yeah, it incorporates so much there. And then the there's an aspect he talks about the system, which is the atmosphere and the planet Earth itself, right? Exactly, yep. Um, and in that, you've basically got four different levels. Briefly, like type one level, uh, the literature spells out that it's the habitat of all biological structures. Mm-hmm. It's kind of interesting here. You've got a type 1, which he refers to as a, a barabashic type humanoid. These are ghosts, goblins. Um, you could you know, potentially put that on all sorts of different weird cryptids and so forth. And then the type 2 humanoid is uh, anything from small insects to human beings. So that's the type 1. So it's basically from ground level uh, to 12,400 meters in the atmosphere. Then there's the type 2 level, which is essentially the battery of the Earth. Um, here is where the... Um, Tritium, which I touch on again in the UFO uh, literature, resides. So it's more or less uh, the battery. And then type 3 would be the brain of the Earth. Here are some of these control complexes are embedded. Again, some of these were already here before this new control system came on board and more or less to control this Earth. And that's basically utilizing different pyramids and so forth below the surface of the Earth. And then you've got type four. And here you've got more complexes, more controls, and it's also at this point that the UFOs uh, reside. So that's the, the system sort of in a high-level nutshell. Um, just kind of think of it as four different hierarchies of, of different materializations of different forms and functions. Right on. Yeah, that's a great breakdown. And when it comes to these uh, type one entities the Barabashiks or whatever, these uh, things that could be considered the paranormal elements of life, ghosts, goblins, and other types of entities. You've seen something like this uh, in your past, right? You, I guess you refer to it in the blog as a ghoul. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. You read that one. That's really mm-hmm. my only uh, paranormal experience. It's real briefly, it was just a night in uh, the downtown area uh, where I was going to school and I happened to be the designated driver that evening and was waiting for friends to come out uh, near bar time. So no alcohol, no no drug use here at this point in time, just to clarify that. Mm-hmm. And uh, two individuals were walking to my left. So I saw a man and a woman. And it, it sounds bizarre, but they almost looked like their, their flesh was decaying. They were decrepit looking. It was very hard to explain. But mm. um, I was talking to somebody and I was keeping an eye on the door as to where my friends were going to come. And I kind of watched them coming from my left. So I made eye contact with them and they immediately caught eye contact with me. So then I thought, well, I'm just going to pretend that I don't see them, see if anybody else notices this in the crowd. They more or less just walked through the crowd. Nobody really uh, seemed to notice it or make note of these two individuals. And as they went from my left to right uh, and they walked down the street, they continued to kind of stare at me so much to the point where they were turning their heads over their shoulders and, and more or less keeping an eye on me. And I was trying to keep tabs of them in my peripheral line of vision. So I, I don't know what that is. I, I asked people that I was talking to that night if they noticed anything out of the sorts and nobody saw it. So I, I honestly don't know what, what that was all about that night. 
Wow, man. I mean, that is that is interesting. I, I love to hear people's personal experiences because you gather enough of them and you start to formulate an idea of what these sightings could be. Crow, have you ever seen anything strange like that? No, uh, not personally, um, but, you know, I've read so much literature, even in, like, religious literature where people see, uh, like, a homeless person on the street and they're just not who you think they are, you know, kind of teaching the lesson to always be kind, you know, because you never know who you're speaking to. But what's funny is every time I hear that kind of thing described, it reminds me of that part of the Matrix where... Uh, the lady's telling Neo, you know, that's where ghosts, werewolves, and vampires, and he says, I've never seen those. And she says, sure you have. Every time that goes on, it's someone doing something they're not supposed to be doing in the, you know, the kind of program of the Matrix. Um, so there's even memes in movies about this kind of thing. Right. Yeah, I, I love that part, too, the Merovingians whole gang. So... We talked about the super system and the standard system being the Earth and its atmosphere. And then um, the subsystem is also involved. And this is a little bit harder to conceptualize. It's a little trickier, right? I, I had a difficult time putting this through. I'm, I'm not as technical as others. and I definitely don't have a background in uh, organic chemistry or anything of the sort. But, but what I can gather, and Crow had touched on this earlier, there's the idea that there's uh, musical notes attached to these, these octaves and there's musical uh, notes that are attached to the periodic table of elements. So I remember from physics, you know, it's kind of the standard format. You have atoms go into matter, you excite atoms, and then you go to the various different forms of, you know, from liquid to gas to, to plasma. Here's where uh, Hattie Bow basically says it's not the case. You basically have uh, strictly organized plasma. That's the building blocks of the universe. And you can put charges to this or you can do something, you can manipulate it with through frequencies, and you can make different things materialize um, and do different things. Um, that was my take on it. You know, I'd be curious to hear if anybody else has maybe got a better sense of it, but I struggled with it. Um, that was the best I could make of it, you know, kind of given my, my knowledge set. Uh, well, let, let me jump in. Yeah, let me jump in. Um, this is one of the parts where you kind of really sense some value here, where we're talking about tonality, octaves, you know, we would equate that with music, I guess, for the common individual transferring over to the building blocks of reality and the, you know, the periodic table. Um, and, you know, for so long I have said that we live in a closed system and that nobody is going above low Earth orbit. And that always brings up the question, well, you know, is this the Truman Show? Are we living in a snow globe? And in the Hattie Bob writings, you know, it's simply about octaves. You're tuned to here. Um, there's no need for a prison of any kind because if you try to leave where you're tuned from, um, that doesn't work. You cease to exist, uh, which would be true of, you know, anything somewhere else, like at the moon, if there was something at the moon, like a machine of any kind tuned to that system. Um, the whole octaves into the periodic table thing, as far as I could understand it, almost seemed like, you know, I'll, I'll let you address this, James, because we're going to have to address the, the old Chinese saying that I'm still trying to find written somewhere, that you will never see a spider come out of a UFO. Sure. But in my mind, um, that reference that they're making, and I still cannot find uh, a, an ancient Chinese reference or saying, but I will still look, um, what they're saying is, whatever's in this thing that you're looking at, a simple octave tune, you know, changes it to whatever they want it to be. Um, and I think that's all very fascinating. But, you know, can you address it all, the, the whole spider from a UFO thing? Have you found the ancient reference at all? I have not. The only thing I've, you know, ultimately discovered is that um, Hattie Bow in one of his ufology posts just says, Hey, if you come upon a UFO that's crashed or has landed, you will never see the spider directly. It's just not going to happen. It could be a spider that is the uh, pilot, but it's got more or less what we, Crow and I talked about this, like a shirt. There's like a, um, some sort of uh, external layer that you and I can see, but we can't ultimately see what's behind that shirt. Hmm. Uh, it's very cryptic um, information, but I haven't seen anything specifically on that Chinese uh, proverb. Yeah, and, and there's a, you know, there's a further claim in, in kind of the UFO stuff that he writes about, which I think is critical because it's kind of where I'm at, where he claims all UFOs are terrestrial. Exactly. And that, yeah, that further underscores a kind of, con, you know, closed system. Um, but as for the shirt reference, I struggled with it for a long time. And what I finally kind of 
decided on was it's almost like something that could change. It was called a shirt. I don't know if it's supposed to look like a shirt, but the translation in the word was correct. I learned this from the Russian speakers. It's almost like all the data, all the information that makes a thing what it is was stored in what they were calling a shirt. And like he said, if there was ever some, you know, automatic vehicle or something uh, working with the system of control down here and it crashed, that shirt just flies away home and takes the data with it. Hmm. Um, almost like a data transfer. That's what it, that's what the whole shirt thing seemed like. I mean, it's very sci-fi. The whole thing is just so sci-fi. <laughs> yeah, very much so. It, it is. James, you also mentioned in an email to me that uh, some some you've stumbled upon some additional information about the creation of the system that you haven't been able to blog about yet. Can you give us some of those details? Yeah, that uh, kind of goes back to that, uh, the origin of humanity on this planet originating from this cluster from Orion. Mm-hmm. Um, I was able to find through a link on one of these Russian sites, which I find really interesting that if I key in some of these uh, buzzwords or these, these words that I'm finding in this literature and Google, I don't, it doesn't pop up. It doesn't even come through as a Russian uh, website. So I have like a specific directory I got to get to to get this information. Mm. Um, but there's a really nice timeline of basically the beginning of time through, I want to say, 2012, 2013, 2014. And I, I haven't gotten to it yet, but uh, I'm looking forward to, again, digesting that and kind of putting it out on the table and saying, hey, you know, take a look at this. Anybody seen anything like this? Anybody know anything about this? Um, it's kind of one of the posts that I'd like to get out here within the next couple of weeks. Yeah, man. I find that really interesting because I've had several guests talk about the Vatican's fascination with Orion and that their observatories are pointed in that direction and that in a lot of their artwork is coded the Orion Nebula. And that's strange, but every time I bring it up to someone, that's what they say is that it alludes to the fact that the Vatican has some indications that that's where life comes from. And so I think that there's a parallel there that's really interesting. And it's interesting you also point out about the uh, having to go to a specific data archive. And this is why uh, six months ago, eight months ago, I was obsessed with the deep web and the idea that there could be huge troves of written research out there that are just below the surface of the internet where Google will not take you. And this Hattie Bob material reminds me of the kind of thing you would find in the deep web if you were skilled enough and savvy enough to get down there. But I just love it. Oh, it's fascinating. <laughs> Google has such a chokehold on information, but I wanted to point out to everybody, very few people understand at the bottom of a Google search engine, you can pick a certain country to search in. And while it doesn't open up huge avenues, you will occasionally find that you do get search returns that are not just the same old, same old, this is what Google thought you wanted to see kind of thing. And I think some of the Hattie Bob research, it would be, you know, really worthwhile to take keywords and go search just Russia and, you know, kind of the Russian speaking areas. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about this section on James's blog about how Hattie Bob's God communicates. I mean, what is Hattie Bob's God? Is this the spider beans we're talking about? That I don't know. Again, this is all speculation, you know, is it, uh, I get the sense that this, if there was a spider race, that they were dying and either they, A, needed our bodies, our earth, our atmosphere, our resources and so forth to survive, or if these actual entities still exist in some way, shape or form. I, mm-hmm. I haven't been able to basically uh, get to the, analysis of that at this point. So that's something I'm still working on. But um, needless to say, something's triggering a signal. There's something that is basically sending information, program data to Earth. Um, but I don't know, you know, at this point, what, what that origin would potentially be. Uh, Crow, do you have any ideas on that one? Yeah, I guess kind of where I landed, what I thought was probably most likely was similar to what you just said, but what we see in the system described is almost like an absentee landlord, um, which is very vexing. You know, why don't we, why aren't they around if these things exist? But the real sense of it I got was that these beings aren't alone. There's other beings because they're preventing other beings from getting here in the description that you laid out in the, you know, kind of breakdown of how the system works. And to me, it implied that there was a God of some sort above everybody. Um, There were clearly supposed to be other beings because they were being prevented from getting here by this race that implemented the control system we see. That's kind of where I landed. Right on. Yeah, it's, it's 
strange. I I kind of thought of it as um, like he talks about horse diplomas being typical university diplomas in a tongue in cheek way. I kind of thought of it as a tongue in cheek thing to describe these overlords like they're just so they have so much power over us. They're essentially a god. But again, it could be anything. And this section is largely about the signal of the controller, the communication behind the scenes that is controlling our game. You know, who is delivering the message? How is the message transmitted? What is the medium for the message? And who is receiving the message? And how do the orders for this control grid get sent around? And this is something uh, I'll just read right from your blog, James. It says, Regardless of the origin of the signal, the super system is the initial source of information and programming. The sun creates the initial message or starts the program through an electromagnetic source code tuned into the 128th octave. I believe this octave resets everything on Earth, biological structure, brain, or otherwise. I mean, that's interesting. We're talking about the signals that control the system coming out of the sun, right? Exactly. Yep. And again, he makes mention that the sun isn't a star, it's a planet, and the planet is no larger than that of planet Earth. That's been referenced a couple times in his works. That's interesting, too, and I that always like kind of is jarring for me to, to hear, but I guess it's just kind of a weird, a weird semantical thing with definitions, because I guess, what is a planet? What is a star anymore when we're talking about the context of this work? I mean, I feel like those concepts are almost out the window in in themselves. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Well, it almost seems like one of the genotypes that he references, uh, one of the smaller groups, the golden million or billion, I don't don't remember the numbers, um, came from the sun, right, James? I mean, isn't that kind of the implication here is that there was a group of people and probably one of the most kind of, you know, special groups came from the sun? Yeah, exactly. It was, uh, again, in this uh, directory that was difficult to find in Russia, there's quite a bit of information on that situation. I think it happened in 2012, I, I, if I'm remembering that correctly. But, yeah, it's just a very fascinating insight. You would never think that beings would be on the planet's sun and they would be transported to Earth at a specific time interval. Um, it's one of the things I want to dig into. I think I got a little bit more information on that that I got to sort through and, and kind of summarize as well. Right on. And then regarding the moon's role, James, you write, As mentioned before, the moon is an inhabited UFO, a construct that sends and receives information to the planet Earth. In this sense, the UFO moon, the lunar wave phenomenon that Crow and others have captured, makes some sense. The moon communicates data to Earth. Hattie Bow mentions that the magnetic source code is the 84th octave, and communication to Earth is only possible after the spring equinox for approximately three months. I believe Hattie Bow states that the window to long-distance communication back to the planet Sir occurs every 11.4 years. Now, I love that paragraph because yeah. if, if we assume that's true, it gives us a real context for why the elite structure their events around certain dates and numbers. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it was interesting that it's specifically 11.4 years. I'm definitely not an astrophysicist, but the, the idea there is that every 11.4 years, the energy of the solar system more or less waxes and wanes. So at this 11.4 year time period, it's at its lowest point, and that allows this data to be transferred between the moon and, you know, potentially this planet Sir, you know, in some far off galaxy. So the the specifics, again, you know, this, it goes to it. I mean, if this is sci-fi, it's got so many details and so many data points that are just acutely tuned into different things. It's, uh, It's just a very interesting puzzle. You know, it makes sense of right at one point I had uh, tried to match up that that piece of the literature to sun cycles and had found I've forgotten what it is there was some sun cycle that was 11 years or in that neighborhood but what's interesting about what he said about communication was if you consider that it happens at the vernal equinox this is when there's all this abundant energy on the planet you know all these things are coming back to life things are being born plants are blooming and he makes that window for three months which is basically when you do see the boom of, of life and growth down here and when you consider the filming of the lunar wave uh, on Yom Kippur of all days in 2012 it's also kind of funny to think about 
that as a download, an information download, when Yom Kippur, as I understand it, and I'm not Jewish, uh, some aspects of it is like asking for you know forgiveness and um, that the finger of God coming down, that kind of thing. So, like you said, the details are crazy if it's all just sci-fi. Right. And then another thing you write, James, about the message itself is you say, in, in Hattie Bow's paradigm, we have the transference of system programs from our solar system neighbors, the sun, the moon, and other moons. The message ultimately dictates life on the planet, whether it be rain needed in Wisconsin, drought needed in the Sahara Desert, mosquitoes needed in Moscow, or babies needed in the Caucasus Mountains. If the message is a reset to cycle time on Earth, the sun transmits directly to Earth. If the message is in regard to a requested change on the planet Earth, the inhabitants of the moon either create the message and communicate to planet Earth or relay a program dictated from Sir to the planet Earth. And that's really interesting because that talks about, I mean, again, with the details, what is the message, what is the program that needs to happen? And that dictates kind of where it will come from, how it will be implemented. And I love the idea that every little thing in our environment from like you said, is a, is our babies needed in the Caucasus Mountains? Is a drought needed in the Sahara Desert? All those things could be programmed by this spider bean control grid. Exactly. You know, and again, who's you know at the top of the pyramid? I mean, you just get the sense when you read his literature that it's basically this continuous loop. You've got signal being transferred. It's being metabolized on Earth by other systems. It's being implemented by various frequencies and octaves and it's doing different things and and it's relaying a feedback loop back to these control centers like the moon and the sun and you know sir every 11.4 years i mean it's this indefinite cycle that's going around and around and, and what exactly is the end game of this you know that's the question and i and i don't know hmm. i mean yeah it's hard to know it's definitely hard to know now this is something that i think is really interesting and, and compelling and jives with mainstream science but I know you plan to do an entire breakdown of the octaves, and I'm anxious for that, and I'm, I'm sure it will be great. But for now, it seems as though Hattie Bob considers these, these things called gravity tubes to be the medium in which these programs are delivered. Uh, he says that the tubes are essentially the conduit that keeps planetary bodies in place, allows UFOs to travel, and transmits and receives information. Now... I'm sure some people are listening to this as some far-out sci-fi saga, but allow me to make this connection here that I think puts some serious fuel on the fire. A few weeks ago, someone sent me this story, and you can find it on almost any scientific website that's out there. Um, the particular one I grabbed for my notes here was from June 3rd of this year. Student confirms that there are enormous tubes of plasma floating around the Earth. And... The article says that a 60-year-old theory about the structure of magnetic fields that surround the Earth has been confirmed directly for the first time. The lead author of the paper is an undergraduate student who invented a way to view the Earth's magnetosphere in three dimensions. And they find that these tubes are positioned about 373 miles above the ground in the upper ionosphere, and they appear to be continuing upwards into the plasmasphere. Now, this is just a mainstream science article talking about some plasma tubes, and of course they aren't going to come to the same conclusions as we are with this stuff, but the parallel, I mean, it's sure. it's pretty creepy, really. It definitely is. I should take a look at that article, but I mean, you basically have guys like John Keel and you know Jacques Vallée and all of these individuals who have been going on about this electromagnetic energy that's around the planet and makes things happen, and you, know, you get into like the secret societies and the studies of occult um, wisdom and vibration. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 to me, it, you know, and I'm not a scientist and I can't, you know, mathematically prove this out, but it feels like it's all connected. Like there's all these various disciplines and research are connected, you know, it doesn't need to, it could be mainstream science coming up with something, but that ties back to something maybe 200 years ago that was written by an occultist in England, you know, who knows, but that's my sense of all of this. It, right. It just feels like it's tied you know, up. James, you should you should mention that that image. You remember the image we were talking about on that one kind of Hattie Bob website that still carries his name that says, you know, the caption under it is the tube. The tube with the electrical uh, lightning. Yeah, there's like this. It, it looks like a massive rope, like the size of a building of electrical kind of lightning bolts going straight up um, and it's just this image on like a Hattie Bob website that carries his name I don't know what, whether it was a blog I've forgotten but the caption under it is the tube sure huh I mean it, it's so crazy but when you look at the pictures from this kid's 
th thing he developed where you can see the ionosphere in three dimensions, it looks like big vacuum tubes, you know, just, you know, they almost look gaseous and that they don't look like necessarily uh, as solid as something like a vacuum tube. They look like they kind of flux, but they're out there apparently. And science is confirming it and science doesn't know what they're for, but they might have just basically uncovered a component of the control grid. Uh, exactly. Yep. I mean, it's a critical piece. This is, um, like I kind of tried to summarize as best I could. It's the medium through which these different programs are being downloaded and uploaded for uh, feedback. Um, yeah. It, it's, it's, again, it's a, it's a fascinating piece to the puzzle. Now, this I'm about to say is, is probably one of my most favorite elements. It gets really crazy, but this is when you get into the receiver of the programs. You know, the programs come through the sun. They come through, um, you know, sir to the moon to us. And then when it gets down to the earth, the receiver of these programs, I mean, we're breaking down these messages and the programs that run the system, they come from the controllers down to these plasma tubes. They're received by a uh, management system on the earth that consists of 2,000 complexes and structures under the surface of the earth, as well as their various UFOs. Apparently, there are nine parent complexes. Can, can you walk us through the locations of these complexes and what Hattie Bob says they're for? Uh, sure. Yeah, the main nine the first one that he makes mention of is Australia. This more or less maintains and produces changes required of the Earth's geography, topography. The second one he has listed is the Great Lakes. Now, he does say that it's not, it's a location, I want to say 200 kilometers west of New York City. And here you have basically the command control center of what he specifically says is 7,909 UFOs on the planet. Wow. Um, and then we get into this uh, Mount uh, Kalash. Kalish, um, over in Tibet and China. This is the main control system of what he called the program. Again, I'm not 100% as to what part of the program that is, but it, it controls the atmosphere and the various genotypes around the world. Wherefore, there's another one in China, Tibet. It sets the controls of the world, and it sets the standards for all facilities on the planet. And I'm not 100%. I, I need to research that more, but I didn't find a whole lot of information on what the definition is of a facility. Um, so that I'm not quite sure on. Uh, number five, Ethiopia. This is the main control center that ensures that tubes um, or communication stay open with the satellites of planets. So here is basically the area that um, if you want the, these various tubes to be in connection with the moon, the sun, other satellites of the solar system, this is all maintained and controlled at this point in Ethiopia. Moscow. This is the main UFO on Earth, and here is mentioned that all the matrices of brains 42, 44, and 46 are stored here. Uh, Greenland manages the brain of the atmosphere and the weather. Ireland, it's the main computing center of the system. And then we have, finally, Antarctica. This synchronizes the shift from winter to summer. So below each of these are more control centers, and I didn't spell them all out for the sake of the, the, the post, but there is a diagram on my blog that highlights in Russian the various uh, hierarchy of those top nine control centers and the sub controls below that and so it's it's quite intense and you know it, it gets it's very detailed and it, there's a different control center that accommodates a different part of the program right I mean to talk about those nine places on the planet and what each one is specifically for the level of detail is obviously is intriguing but it's also I mean, how does a person even get this information? It almost <laughs> seems channeled or something. But Crow, any uh, any thoughts on the nine parent complexes and when what we just mentioned there? Yeah, you know, it's so funny because when you start to dig into the historical information that we have on any of these places, you start to see parallels. But the one that really stuck out to me was the UFO Control Center in the Great Lakes because there has absolutely been, you know, just so much recorded unknown aerial activity in Michigan and the Great Lakes area, although most of it is the kind of TV crap that comes to us and, you know, the UFO books that I don't think are much value. Uh, truth is, is that there have been a lot of reports of this kind of thing. So as you dig into each of these areas, or even Ireland, you know, there's so many people now working to show, you know, the Scottish rights Freemasonry in that part of the world, how it connects to all these things that are going on we see it's it's amazing and that's where you really start to get you know i would even mention uh, i saw a movie recently called radio free albumuth at the time i didn't realize that it was lifted from a philip k dick 
uh, writing called Bayless. But as I watched the movie, you know, my wife and I were laughing that it was like almost pulled directly from Hattie Bob. A lot of it switched around a little bit, but then I found out it was Philip K. Dick. And it's just, you know, you end up saying, God, how is there so much specificity in all this? It's crazy. I, I don't know what to add. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, I love that in this in this paradigm, UFOs are accounted for. He talks about them being just machines in this control center. You look at a quarry of uh, machinery that's digging out a rock quarry. There's all types of different machines. And if you were like an ant living in that quarry in your natural universe, you're looking at all these multiple different types of machines. Of course, with uh, this this paradigm, they're a little more cloaked than we are with, uh, you know, caterpillars and bulldozers, but it's kind of the same sort of thing. Yeah, it's crazy. James and I were talking about, like, some of the crazy things I've shot transiting from the moon um, and how it kind of compares to, you know, Hattie Bob's talking about shadow ships and other things that are basically just little worker drones maintaining the system of basically deception. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. But it's only a system of deception. If, if something like this was to exist, it's because the people who run this place have painted a totally different picture of where we are. But, um, yeah, it's crazy to think, uh, you know, I'm filming this little black thing. There's no description of it out there. It doesn't match the information for satellites. And then here's this crazy Russian guy writing about UFOs saying, yeah, that's terrestrial. And it's, you know, working, it's maintaining the system. It's a drone for the most part. Yeah, it's crazy. (laughs) And I love that with these plasma tubes, it's almost like, because it also ties into octaves when you talk about how the, the missions or, you know, when I say missions, I mean something like causing a, a drought, let's say in California, like we're experiencing. It seems like the information comes through these plasma tubes in the form of an octave. It's like these tubes could be the strings of a solar system sized guitar. And then these octaves play through and things happen. And uh, you do provide the example in your writing, James, about how this stuff plays out. And that is the scenario I just mentioned, a drought in California, or more specifically, the spider overlords deciding that they want the strawberry yield in California to be significantly lower. Let's Using this as an example, can you walk us through how uh, the details of how this the program comes into play and manifests? Yeah, sure. I, um, I used strawberries only because I've got a brother that is out in California and that it's as good of an example as any, you know? <laughs> so, yeah. So if, if for whatever reason, say the program or the, the origin of the program dictates that strawberries in California are not to be significantly greater than the previous years. And again, I, I don't know what the reason would be for that. Uh, there's the idea that the lunatics on the moon, and I say lunatics because that is a translation that came through when I did run it through there, uh, the Google translator, mm-hmm. um, they make that decision. So I'm making an assumption that, the individuals on the moon make the decision that strawberry yield will be less in 2015 versus 2014. After the spring equinox, the moon transmits through its tube, as you had mentioned before, a command. And this command is made up of, of a string of octaves or um, various notes that are getting sent to planet Earth. And that triggers less rain in California. So the data string then would go from moon to Chekhov. Chekhov is the main more or less control center on the face of the Earth. And then it gets routed to Greenland. Uh, Greenland then transmits octaves into the atmosphere that reduces the number of rainstorms in California. So you're talking about weather manipulation um, through the use of frequencies and so forth, which you, you've hinted on in some of your previous episodes, I know. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the, uh, the octaves charge highly organized plasma in the atmosphere. And through these specific charges, reduce the likelihood of precipitation produced over the state of California. I did throw in the possibility that um, to get the UFOs incorporated in this scenario, say for whatever reason, the system has a glitch and there is a rainstorm that makes its way to California. The UFO then is up in atmosphere. It takes note of this exception, uh, something that's contrary to the overall program. It then feeds that information essentially back to Greenland, where then Greenland adjusts the program to the original Luna program. Uh, Future rainstorms, in theory, then are prevented and the original goal of reducing uh, strawberry yields is uh, performed. So mm-hmm. I tried to kind of put it in so that even I can make sense of all this information. I tried to put it in kind of a context of a specific example. Yeah, man. I mean, that's an amazing breakdown and it really kind of brings it down to earth on what 
what when people talk about a holographic universe or a controlled environment, I mean, these are the details that that we need to not just be kind of talking out of our ass. I mean, this <laughs> this makes sense. I mean, Crow, what are you thinking here? <laughs> well, every time I, I go over that or hear that, I was talking with James about it, and I was reading his blog. You know, it kind of if something like that was reality, it would put a new spin on resources, wouldn't it? You know, <laughs> there's so much water here, and it's going where it's going. Doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's kind of it's a funny thing. I'm not suggesting that people <laughs> should just ignore rationing water in California or anything, but I'm just saying um, it it really is kind of an alternative view on you know if this is a closed system, what's here is here and it's allocated where it's allocated almost independent of, of whatever we do in right. a model like this. Yeah, I mean, that is a great point. But of course, we're not going to just throw everything to the wind and take up the religion of Hattie Bow, but <laughs> you're right. I mean, that is interesting. And James, you've also talked a little bit about how you think this stuff jives with the electric universe model, something we've talked about before on the air. Do you think these uh, things do complement each other? Yeah, I do. You know, I'm, I don't have a complete understanding of the, uh, the electric universe model. You know, I get the idea that there's all this electricity um, that basically provides the foundation to our existence and planets and that. So, again, it's another future post. I really want to explore that with some of the Saturn information and so forth. Um, but the thing that I um, actually, even more so than that, I really think there's a correlation with some of the research I've done on Oregon and some of the work of uh, Wilhelm Reich and uh, Trevor James Constable. These are some individuals who kind of subscribe to the belief of Oregon. Wilhelm Reich is actually the individual who did that. Um, and he has this book, I think it's called Contact with Space, that he wrote in the 1950s, right before he um, was imprisoned and all of his books were burned and a lot of his you notes. Know, kind of another outcast scientist that was kind of on the forefront of a lot of different ideas back in the 40s and 50s. He actually went to battle with UFOs in Tucson. Uh, Arizona. So mm -hmm. he and his group took some t cloud busting technology out into the desert. These UFOs formed. They were monitoring him. Um, the, the goal there was that Reich and his group was going to basically transform uh, the desert into a soil that could produce crop and vegetation. And uh, he makes mention that these UFOs had this deadly organ radiation, if I remember that correctly, where these UFOs are basically in place, they're hovering, and they're basically trying to keep this climate in place. And, and Reich and his fearless group of Oregon cloud-busting techs are fighting these UFOs. And I just see a lot of similarity with some of that Oregon research and the idea of these um, of Hattie Bow's research in the atmosphere and this energy and this life force and so forth. Yeah, man, that is fascinating. I mean, the, the, I've heard that story before of Wilhelm Reich and his cloud-busting gun, but I never really put together the fact that he is talking about you know, he's, he's shooting stuff into the air. It's messing with the control system. So if there is a system in place and there are UFOs and machines that kind of dictate its usage, then to have someone come and throw a wrench in that is going to draw the attention of these machines. And then he gets into a conflict with them. But this also jives with Crow has a few pieces of footage he's captured of chemtrails and UFO chemtrail planes and UFOs near each other again. Maybe the layer is that the United States government and some shady corporations are manipulating the weather, and then UFOs are coming and saying, "Hey, what's going on here? You know, we've been running this system for so long, no one's been manipulating it. Now for a couple of decades, you're flying things into it. We got to fix this." But it is interesting because the you have filmed some things, Crow, that that show the connection between weather manipulation and UFOs. There's no doubt. And of all the things that I have filmed, you know, so many people ask me, are they aliens? And I always say, I believe they're terrestrial based. But these things that you see in these kind of white looking plasma -y orbs looking in the chemtrail, even one firing into the chemtrail, clearly being steered independent of the wind. You know, if anything I had filmed is, is bizarre enough to consider, it would be those, though I still think they're terrestrial. Um, I would mention I've got a lot of friends that have the whole Oregon cannon thing going on, trying to keep the skies clear so that they can film and do other things or just have clean air, and they get so much attention 
from um, chem planes literally circling where they've got their cannon, uh, choppers, military vehicles just being in the area when they normally wouldn't be. So, I mean, I think there's something definitely to this. And who can deny that these Oregon cannons work? I mean, we see it. We see that these Oregon cannons will punch a hole in chem cover. It's not really a debatable thing. It's been filmed and shown enough times um, that we know that that's a real thing. And yet we don't have any real scientific mainstream description of Oregon that I'm aware of. And uh, what we are aware of is the man who came up with this was really kind of jailed and suppressed. So Mm -hmm. it's all very crazy. But I would say of all the things I've filmed, those orbs are kind of the most vexing things. I mean, what the heck are we looking at there? Yeah. Yeah. And this kind of connects us to another part of James's blog that I think is really interesting. The uh, section about the fuel source of these crafts Tritium, I believe, is what you call it, right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, that's what uh, Hattie Bow had basically pointed out. Yep, tri- tritium is the element. And this is interesting because tritium apparently has a connection to water, and that explains why so many UFO reports involve water or witnessing uh, of UFOs siphoning up water and things like that, which I've definitely heard reported. I know. It's, it's amazing. I, I told Crow this the other day. It's almost as if... You have a unified field theory to explain for these various UFO encounters on the face of the earth. It's, it's amazing. But yeah, it's exactly what it is. It's a, it's a fuel source is what Hattie Bowe is arguing that um, these UFOs need this in order to perform their, their functions on the planet. Yet a very interesting tidbit again. This, the details here are amazing. Mm-hmm. He makes mention that you have the specific gravity of water at one gram per centimeter cubed. When you remove tritium, you now have water with a specific gravity of 0.77 grams per, per centimeter cube. So, again, the detail here, you know. Mm, yeah. You know, I could add, I could add something here, too, in, in terms of the scientific value of what Hattie Bob did. There were some physicists who had come to my channel and, uh, you know, not impressed with Hattie Bob. So what they did is they were going to take his speed of light. I think it was speed of light. Uh, I'm not sure I've got that 100%, but I believe it was a speed of light calculation. And they were going to test it with their ability as physicists. And they came back and stated that, yeah, his calculations are absolutely right, but he's using a wrong constant, this wrong kind of formula to begin with. And that just kind of really stuck out to me that they were saying it's all correct, but he's using something else to get where he's going that we don't accept. And that kind of plays into the whole horse diploma, new world science thing that he talks about. But in terms of details and his science working out, this just goes to show there is so much specificity here, and some of it's been kind of carried through to demonstrate that there is valid science here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I, I totally agree. Part of the game plan seems to be you screw with the initial premise, and then you let these academic types do whatever they want with that because they're always going to come to erroneous conclusions when they start from a faulty premise. And maybe what we're looking at here is the 180, the flip of that. You know, Hattie Bob is dealing with the suppressed information, the secret components, and working out formulas that a typical scientist can look at and say, yeah, that formula makes sense, you know, structurally, but they can't really rationalize it because they don't have that missing component. And I think that's really the basis of so much manipulation in math and science and music. Uh, All these components seem to really jive together, but there is a little piece of it that's been cut out in quarantine, so no one ever really puts the pieces together. You know, I often wonder if um, something as simple as base 10 counting could be the limiting factor for us here on this planet. And the reason I say that is because in computers you use hexadecimal, which is basically a base 15 a lot. Um, Even movies being made now where they're showing all this kind of high-tech chicanery going on with computer companies at a high level, they're all counting in hex, hexadecimal. You know, that's how it's being portrayed. And the reason I think it's interesting is because we're told the supposed ancient Sumerian race was counting in base 60. And when you think about that, so really the first civilization that ever came around was counting in base 60. Um, it makes sense to count in base 10 because the first people would use their fingers and toes, right? Mm-hmm. So how the heck do you get to base 60? But the reason I'm mentioning this is what if being able to take what we know further was as simple as not counting in base 10? And that's what I always think about when I kind of see the Hattie Bob stuff. Nice. Yeah, that makes sense. And James, in your piece about UFOs, you 
very eloquently say that when you start looking into this, you usually start with the standard extraterrestrial hypothesis, then move to a military industrial hypothesis, then a crypto terrestrial one, then to the ultra dimensional hypothesis. And I think up to that point, you are really accurate in describing my progress through ufology. And I think a lot of people, those are the conclusions that kind of bounce around the little pinball machine to try to determine what the truth is. And I'm curious in your research and the length of time you've been looking at UFOs now that you have this new context for the Hattiebov control system, have there been things you've seen in the past with ufology that you would say equate here that, that jive with this uh, idea? Well, definitely the, uh, you know, so many examples of UFOs taking water, like you had mentioned previously to that. Mm -hmm. I really love John Keel. I know he gets ripped on quite a bit for kind of jumping around in his material, but I thought he did a great job. And I think Operation Trojan Horse in the Eighth Tower, where he basically, one of the first ones that I actually read where he talked about UFOs and the idea that you can be in a, a field of vision or a field of the electromagnetic spectrum where it's not visible to the human eye. And then suddenly it'll pass through and it'll go from a red to blue to disappearing. And then, you know, you've got nothing there. It turns into blue. It shifts through the colors of the rainbow and it exits out on a red. Mm -hmm. Um, And you think about that in the context of this control system. I mean, to me, you know, stuff like that, it it does die. And I mean, I'm not saying that's the reality of the situation, but um, so much of this, when you read the Hattie Bow stuff, he talks about these UFOs having the technology to bend light and to mix the the colors of the rainbow and the spectrum, um, more or less kind of create a a camouflage that allows these things to, you know, basically float around the atmosphere and, and monitor the planet. So, uh, you know, the crypto terrestrial stuff, again, I, I'm kind of with you. I think that's fascinating. Um, there's a really good book by Mac Tony's on that. And, you you know, one of the habitats uh, is is layer four of the Earth, and that's where the UFOs reside. I mean, that's below Earth. Yeah. And suddenly you have something that's accounting for these ships that are docked below the Earth that so many people have talked about in books and in research. Um, it's, it, to me... To be honest with you, to me, and I told Crow this, it's, it was the idea of his UFOs and just, it really resonated with me in context of the Hattie Bow stuff written about uh, UFOs. So, uh, I don't know if that makes any sense, yeah. but that's kind of where I'm at with, uh, with the UFO thing here with Hattie Bow. Absolutely. Those are great points. Very awesome. Well, James, thanks so much for doing this. I know it can be nerve wracking and it's easy to just... It's easy to just say no, but I'm glad you were willing to step up onto the THC stage with us. I, I'm sure you'll get a fair amount of added attention, I hope, which is well-deserved. Please remind people where they can actually follow your blog and read over much of what we talked about today and the other things you're going to be doing. Uh, sure, yeah. It's just Sage Sigma Unbound is the, the blog site. And if anybody wants to get a hold of me with uh, Hattie Bow material or, or whatnot, it's... Um, Sage Sigma at gmail.com. And then I also have a Twitter handle, Sage Sigma. So uh, standard social media stuff, but I'm just really hoping all of this opens up further doors to, to be explored. Right on. So you call it Sage Sigma Unbound, but I guess the address is sage sigma.blogspot.com? Uh, correct. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yep. It's the standard Google blog account. Yep. Right on. And Crow, I know you have this 10,000 mile road trip coming up. Anything you'd like to say about that? Yeah, I am going to be taken off. I'm not going to announce the date. I'm trying to kind of be undercover brother about all that. Um, that is the next big thing I'll be doing. But before we get off, um, James and I had kind of talked and decided it might be important to do a reach out to Russia um, or other Russian-speaking nations that may be more familiar with Hattie Bob than we are, that may be able to give us links, data, um, some insight where we could learn more. Um, I mean, we're all just wondering, is this sanitized? Is this sci-fi? But so much of it is so detailed and seems to have value. But anyhow, um, in closing, yes, the next big thing I'm going to do is the road trip. On the road trip, I'll be doing the same things I always do. I'll be filming for chemtrails in a roughly 30 states. I will be doing some optical terrestrial tests uh, to challenge some of the conventions about what we were told this place where we live and some other tests that I won't talk about, but that will be the next big thing coming up. Right on. And yeah, I definitely think putting out a call to Russia is, is fair. I mean, if there's any Russian listeners, definitely uh, maybe you can put this in some context of just who the man was. I'm pretty curious about that. Like uh, most average Russians, I would assume should be able to dig on their internets and find some information 
about the man himself. And, you know, if you do, you've got their emails, you've got mine. You know, you can always have Putin give me a call. I'm down. I'd love to, I'd love to get to the bottom of some of this stuff. But uh, one criticism I guess I'd point out in that realm is I hope people aren't sick of us talking about this stuff. I find it fascinating, and I don't think we do a show unless we can – move the needle further into understanding. And I, I think that adding James to this call was perfect for that. But people are critical. They say, well, what's the big deal? It's it's a trove of information. It needs to be translated into English. Just do it. Just uh, I want someone, uh, the guy from Houston Skywatch suggested using Fiverr. I know that is a website that does that, but I've used them before for music and it's deceptive how cheap it really is. It actually, to, re- to do pages and pages and pages would be quite a bit of money. And not to say that quite a bit of money can't be gathered to do that, but uh, I don't think anyone here is being deceptive in any way but it's been alluded that we're leaking we're having the information come out slowly so we can milk the saga and that is in in no way what what i'm trying to do i think what we pointed out today we got into as much detail as we can which is far with as far as your research has gone with both of you guys and i'm totally open like we're not hiding the information. It's it's publicly available. We've got links in both Crow's articles and James' first post on Hattie Bob also has the link directly to the material, the archive. So anyone can pull it up and start digging through it. I mean, James is here today because he's actually <laughs> looked at it at such a dense level and, and kind of clarified it for everyone that I just had to, to share it on the air. But um, no one's being deceptive here. The information's there. Read through it yourself. If you find some conclusions, let us know. Any Russian researchers who can maybe, even even if you're not a researcher, just Russian-speaking people who can add some clarity to what's going on here would be well appreciated. But, you know, that said, it's been very awesome, guys. Um, thanks so much. Of course, Crow with two R's, C-R-R-O-W-777 is Crow's YouTube channel. Uh, sagesigma.blogspot is James's website. Guys, thanks so much. Take care of yourself out there. Yeah, thanks for All having right. us. I appreciate your guys' time. Thanks, man. Good to, good to see you guys, and thanks so much, James. I think it's fair to say you are the preeminent English-speaking Hattie Bob guy now. Oh, well, thanks. It's very flattering. I'll, <laughs> I'll do my best, yeah. For sure. All right. Peace out, guys. Boom, people. There we have it. I like doing the three-man show. It's a little harder to control the audio quality, but I think that was pretty good despite a little interference. I love hearing more details about this material, and James really breaks it down. I loved it. You know, there was a part there where James mentioned that Hattie Bob states that everything starts with plasma, and I don't know which hour of the Richard Merrick show touched on this, but even he considered the start of the Earth to be a spinning plasma disc. So I think when you take Richard Merrick and Santo Bonacci and Crow, and James in this Hattie Bob breakdown, just in the last three or four or five shows, I think so many aspects of these guest material interconnect. I also love the nine major control centers and the idea that UFOs are the maintenance crew for our galactic aquarium. Of course, in the Plus show, we're all over the place speculating and discussing this stuff. Also, Crow blasts NASA pretty good for their flyby mission of Pluto. I love to poke holes in the presentation of NASA stuff, making me wonder what the hell really is up there if NASA's missions are all fake. We also talk about the ritual aspects of the Pluto stuff with NASA and Chris Knowles' post from the Secret Sun blog at secretsun.blogspot.com, a site well worth checking out. I was turned on to Chris Knowles via Gordon White, and I'm hoping we can get him on the show eventually. I think we're going to. But either way, I would say this one was a good one. And it's an important realization that so much of modern science's thinking hinges on just a few key scientists and institutions, and then we catch them lying, and we're really left wandering in the dark trying to figure this reality out for ourselves. You know, I got into a pretty dark conspiracy recently that discussed Stephen Hawking and how apparently he was uncovering some very revealing scientific information early on and was starting to get a little too vocal about it, So instead of just killing him off, they made him a vegetable and started speaking through him like a puppet. A very dark idea, but think about the serious influence of that man and how the ideas we're told came from him have shaped modern science and our thoughts about space. Hawking is considered an infallible god of science, a true authority, and this is reinforced by establishment media, meetings with Obama and TED Talks and appearances on the Big Bang Theory, and we might really be dealing with a Weekend at Bernie's situation. I don't know, but I found it interesting in the wake of this topic of just how much of our mental picture of reality is shaped by authority and how his piece of the puzzle might fit in. 
Just imagine being stuck in that vegetative state, just aching to cry out, they're using me, they're lying to you. But you just can't. Oh man, creepy. But either way, Crow shows are always a blast. Big thanks to him and James. Again, sagesigma.blogspot.com to check out what James is doing. The link for him and Crow will be included with the show. I'm getting out of here, but it is your move, Spider Beans of the Clockwork Control Scheme. Your frickin' move. Crow what? it's your show now. So what's it gonna be? Because people will tune in to hear another new conspiracy. Almost too much of we thought this was low it's bad getting worse so where'd all the good people go they're on the higher side chats because it's everybody's favorite show where'd all the good people go he got your mars coat and white and then there's crow They talk this and that on the higher side chat Testing one, two, now what you gonna do? Bad news, misuse, got too much to lose Give me some truth, now whose side we on? Whatever you say, turn on the boob tube I'm in the mood to obey, so lead me astray By the way now, where'd all the good people go? They locked them up it seems for protesting Monsanto Where'd all the good people go? They're on the THC, my favorite show. Sitting down, new episode to hear. Wanna light a bolt, but I fear the police. Can you hear me? Can't interrupt me from this friendly conversation. Waiting all week for THC With the car wood, there's no hesitation Exposing the truth, getting to the elite Scams, schemes, conspiracies, and treason It's an excellent show, what I need to know Is where'd all the good people go? Been only getting hate and fear from all the other hoes Where'd all the good people go? Guess that makes THC my favorite show Where'd all the good people go? They talk this and that on the higher side chat Testing one, two, now what you gonna do? Bad news, misuse, got Give me some truth, you got too much to lose Whose side are we on today, anyway? Okay, whatever you say Wrong and resolute, but in the mood to obey Station 